web modeling, you know, when you look at when you design our application to support webhooks or to consume incoming webhooks, and by definition, webhooks are open-ended integration with arbitrary web services. That means, uh, and this guy loves those stuff, right? And it's really good for security when there's open-ended and arbitrary words, right? So you don't know how you should trust the service that is sending this, this, um, uh, those webhooks, and also, if you expose and support webhooks, outgoing webhooks, you don't know how it could be abused. And different, just um, go over quickly about different like threads that could be here. Uh, so it's designed to send requests to unknown servers, right? So anybody can go to your online servers and just paste in like a URL, right? With the, so one of the attack vectors is like attacking arbitrary servers, like for DDoS or others, and just mm, triggering uh, different events in the system, and lots of requests will go to those servers. Um, you know, um, manipulating the IP address, maybe IP address of validations of those services instead of sending directly to your targets. Uh, SSRF, um, you could just go and place like localhost, right? So when you trigger an event in the system, it will send a request to itself. That's classic for SSRF. Application eavesdropping. So if your application uses third-party um, service that supports webhooks, if you have access to this third-party and the authorization scheme is different from your application authorization scheme, and probably in those applications, you could just you know, proxy change this URL to proxy all the webhooks request to your application and then proxy back to the original URL. And nobody will know about this one. Uh, hiding data exfiltration. So instead of just, uh, you know, if you have a malware instead, inside the network, instead of just sending directly to your CNC from the endpoint to your CNC server, you could just register a webhook on some internal service, uh, like Git, for example, and the webhook URL will be your CNC. So your endpoint won't be uh, sending any direct traffic to your CNC, but just sending some commits to Git, which is like a legitimate traffic inside the network, right? And the Git server will send those requests to, um, to your CNC server. Incoming webhook tracks, that's like on the receiving part. So the main issue here is um, that you don't know um, as I said, the authorization models, for example, if you integrate with Slack and you would like to receive different, uh, you use Slack people or like bots, different bots that part of your like uh, say CD pipeline or something else. And so you have different roles and levels in your application, right? But it doesn't, it's not the same as the Slack authorization schemes and different roles. So sometimes when you design your application using Slack, um, sometimes someone who has less permissions in your application, but have like the same permissions as others in the Slack channel, right? So he could abuse the Slack channel to uh, get in your application. And the real examples, you know, bug, bug like in GitHub online service and SSRF that was uh, actually exploited to a full remote code execution on GitHub and won like $7,000 bug bounty. Uh, so why should we care, right? Uh, everybody uses today webhooks. Any platform today and use webhooks, you, anyone. So let's see several, like the point is how we abuse the API developers and how Webhooks change not only the, um, our concerns in production, but also during the development itself, and how it's different from the regular uh, development practices. Um, so one of the challenges when you build webhooks, you rely on third-party applications, right? And if you're like developing on your computer, on your laptop, on your station, um, you have some APIs, right? How do you test webhook integrations. You need to receive, um, uh, to have like a listening port, right, in your organization, but that requires the regular process, right, going to the uh, security department, asking, you know, to open some port and forward it to a specific um, area, which like the militarized uh, zone. So it's a challenge and there are solutions. Remember the Engrok service? 
Um, so, there are several solutions out there. Online tools, right? Great. People love online tools instead of installing. So, we start seeing where going deeper and understanding like what's what's those services and like why people use it and how much they use it. We've seen like on almost all the forums, you know, talking about those types of services and that how easy to just, you know, redirect this traffic and tunnel it to your application. The problem is that the developers don't really understand what they are doing. They'll just will go to this server, download some client, and they don't understand that they have like HTTP tunnel in, on their um, directly to their uh, endpoint. You see in, from the an example from an Atlassian uh, forum, and there are many more of those services out there, and they're just laundering the old good tunnels with the uh, webhook testing words. So let's see an example, like just to showcase the problem. You know, that's that's the main challenge. You know, we are talking about when you use um, uh, it's a classic like architecture today for the organizations, and you know, there's the internal zone, there's the DMZ. Uh, so usually, someone who would like to hack your organization, right? They will go for you know the um, there's a, the military zone, which is separate from the internal zone. But once you have those, you know. Yeah, um, applications directly exposed to the internet, internet by the developers, uh, someone could hack and, you know, the meaning of this hack and the damage is to be inside your corporate network and not inside the uh, DMZ. Uh, the other thing and the other concern here is that actually, you know, there's no, like, all this SDLC pro process, right, the secure development lifecycle and, and the hardening of your application before it goes to uh, to the DMZ uh, for production or even for, like, staging environment, uh, you don't have those processes. So, most probably, uh, you will expose an application that wasn't pen tested, that wasn't audited, your environment is not hardened, right, just your development environment. And that's different from the classic development right, cycle because the classic development cycle, uh, developers won't um, won't expose you know a web server locally on their endpoint, but go on the regular uh, path. So let's see a case study with the specifically you know focus on this Angrok service to see like uh, what can we take out this one. Let's see, like, switch to Tomer. Okay, so let's see a case study by exploiting Engrok. So I will start an Engrok server. This server is now um, online. It's just, uh, oh, why is that? Hope we will see it now. What? So the presentation is fine, but. Okay. Now we can see it. Okay. So I will start the Angro uh, client again. Now this Angro client is a link to another uh, application inside my internal network. And now this internal application could be accessed by uh, people from the outside world and not just from the internal network or the local host. So now I can just surf this web and I will see the application. Now, those applications, like Max said, doesn't have an SDLC and people won't um, fix those bugs automatically because those are internal applications and every developer knows that if it's internal, it's okay that we will have security bugs. Uh, but no, no, it's not. So let's see what happens when you uh, put this uh, internal application outside. So let's say uh, I have some demo. It's actually a, a Tomcat and this Tomcat server is uh, vulnerable to a put method. That means that when I send put method with data, it will create a file with this data. So I can just take this 
command. I will put it in CMD. I will send it to my server. And now I should have cmd.jsp. That way. And I have cmd.jsp. So who am I? I'm root. And that's it. I'm in the Intel network. Uh, no problem. So um, now I will show another example of how people can see those uh, uh, endpoints. So this endpoint is actually uh, my endpoint. It's never posted on the internet, so no one's supposed to know what this endpoint is, or what, where to find it. But sometimes people create their own uh, certificates, like SSL pinning or just they want to create their own certificate for security reasons. So let's take the domain name and put it here in, as a subdomain in um, crt.sh that will show us lots of certi certifications that were created lately. And you will see that we have here the domain that I showed the vulnerability on. So that's another way to uh, find uh, those endpoints, to enumerate the domains by using uh, tools like um, um, subdomain analyzer and other tools that will find subdomains by looking at lots of websites and then you will be able to exploit them. So back to Max. So we just wanted to understand like how, how popular this one and you know we just enumerated different domains both by using like you know sublist uh, um, you know domain analyzer and say um, search so sh and just enumerating you know, dictionaries like uh, you know um, different domains and found the Italian post you know website that was actually like allowing uploading APK and like uh, different iOS apps to their um, store, which seems like a development environment. Another example, some travel group with like a login password, right? Everything is okay, but vulnerable SQL injection. Um, some other website, in Tomer's example, a default Tomcat installation with just no authentication on the manager, just upload any jar and you have, you own this, uh, endpoint. Uh, another company which like uh, allowed guest authentication. An interesting one was some banking service, which is like uh, had, like some Swift API. You see the same Tomcat admin is open there on this endpoint. And when we looked at the API, we found the source code on the Git bucket. You know, like that's. Um, and many more examples that just few and like the domain selling company had like uh, see like internal server using ngrok uh, and there were like PHP might be without authentication with lots of databases. So testing webhooks right that's just one attack vector right so that's like uh, not specific vulnerability in this channel, right? But how people use, how people develop those applications. That's a real concern today because the, the trendscape changes not just for the production, as we say, but also for the development. Um, and the webhook testing online tools, that's just one example. There are other categories that you could inspect using online tools, inspect incoming like API requests instead of uh, deploying, uh, you know, proxy, um, tool on the server, you just use some online service and provide this URL as the endpoint that you can use those online tools. And many of them are indexed and not protected with any, you know, like password or credentials. So anyone could just enumerate those uh, pages and see real requests in production even um, on those websites. 
Uh, so we wanted to try to see like, okay, uh, let's look for more vulnerabilities. Like, okay, what happens if those guys install those clients? How we can abuse also those clients, right? Because to create this channel, those uh, tunnels, you need to um, deploy this executable, this tunnel locally, and then, you know, like it says like, take advantage of a powerful local inspector. That means after you uh, install this tool on your device as, the, as a developer, you have also a local website uh, um, that you could see all the incoming requests um, for debugging as a proxy, right, on this tunnel. Uh, so we found some vulnerability there that allowed our, actually to enumerate, like, if we could convince anyone to get into, our, into any developer with this tool installed to our um, phishing website, we could just um, enumerate all the tunnels, tunnels and also do some more interesting st stuff. So take advantage. Please take advantage. Okay, so again, if we have, a, we, if we know a developer that uses uh, Ngrok, we can do lots of stuff. So in the older version, uh, uh, of course, this, uh, fix, uh, this bug was fixed because we told Ngrok guys that they have this bug and they fixed it. Actually, they don't use WebSocket anymore. So this bug is a WebSocket bug. They just have a, a WebSocket connection. I will show it right now. So if we use, they have uh, the local host. So local host, 4040. Am I in the inspector? So here the inspector um, uh, get all the information from one WebSocket connection. I will refresh and you'll see this connection. So here in this connection, there's just messages that show all the information about the uh, tunnels that you have right now. So they just stopped using uh, WebSocket, so this vulnerability <laughs> removed. But uh, th still, there another vulnerability that, that I will show here. So here is an example what happens when someone uh, enter a website and this website only connects to the internal network, uh, the, to the local host uh, WebSocket server, and just get all the information about all the hooks and even requests that got to those hooks and uh, statistics and everything. So this is a, okay. This is a, a really a short example. I will show another example uh, of a vulnerability that was never fixed, and I'm not sure if they will fix it because this vulnerability is presented in every, almost every uh, web server. So I, um, I will show a sneak peek of Red Tunnel that I will show in another uh, uh, presentation on B-Sides and O and Black Hat and other uh, uh, conventions as well. So this is an example of someone that play uh, just solitaire. And of course, uh, behind the scenes, there's the red tunnel uh, iframe. And this red tunnel iframe connected to uh, the red tunnel core uh, management system. So this is the red tunnel management. Of course, you can see that someone connected. It started uh, pinging the hosts, of course, Local host is a... Maybe, maybe just to say, it's a phishing site, right? Yes. That's like the gaming card, online gaming card, solitaire that a developer access, and we have like our malicious JavaScript, and following the vulnerabilities on those clients that are bound at listening to connections on local host, you could actually exploit those services. So the whole DNS rebinding process uh, is automatic in a, a red tunnel. So it scanned for the port, it found the port, it, it knows that this port is a, a HTTP port, and now it starts to uh, uh, do the DNS rebinding uh, process, and we can see it here on the logs, the same thing, it's just because it's a debug uh, version. And we can see the rebinding process is over, so let's go back here, and we can explore the uh, application. And now we actually surf this, the same application, but externally from our, uh, from Red Tunnel, and we can just use the API like any, uh, uh, any normal guy that used the uh, developer, development version of uh, this inspector. So we see that we have an API and we can call uh, slash API slash tunnels to uh, create a tunnel. So let's 
use it to our advantage. So I will go here. I will take this JavaScript simple code that just send post requests to slash API slash tunnels. I will clear the logs to see that it's here. Let's see that I didn't mess up. And I have a TCP connection. Let's try. And now also RDP is in a, we have tunnel to the RDP as well. That's a thing that we couldn't do with a regular uh, DNS rebinding attack. Okay, Max? One second. So just to summarize the attack, uh, so Tomer exploited here the client, you know, the developer that installed this client, and the client was vulnerable to this, um, you know, had this um, website, like, uh, not website, like the tools, the debugging tool, the proxy running on localhost, and Tomer used DNS rebinding attack to actually to bypass the cross-region policy, and the problem is that this, um, Though this debugging tool didn't use any authentication, right? Because it's on local host, right? Why should you care? And if it doesn't have any authentication, you could just do the DNS rebinding attack where you quickly switch the DNS record to the local host. And so you load one page, you know, the managed HTML, you load it from your website, right? Because the DNS points to your website. But the time to leave for this DNS record is like zero. So the if you try to render another iframe inside your original code, the browser will go to your DNS again. But now you return a record with the local host. Uh, uh, and then the browser will go to the local server and load the website, the local website in this iframe. But from the browser perspective, it's running in the same origin. Because both the iframe and the top frame are in the same domain, which is your domain. So you could read all this information, and the Red Tunnel tool is actually an exploitation framework for this one. Okay. So what Tomer did is exploited actually uh, this um, uh, Angro client with this local tools to uh, doesn't have any authentication to create another tunnel because that's what it supports. It has REST API to create another tunnel, and it creates not only it supports not only HTTP tunnels but also TCP tunnels. And in our case, just create a TCP tunnel for like the RDP port, right? And to forward all the RDP traffic with our own user and just connect over, you know, take control over this uh, uh, device. And they promise much more, right? So that's just one service out of many services. And you see like hundreds of thousands of users just for this service. If you just Google Angrok I or other service, you'll see lots of results. Uh, so what we can do? Don't panic. This guy has a beard. So from the defender's perspective, oh, this look good. Uh, you could, of course, monitoring a black blacklisting those services in your firewall, right? Because those clients are like the regular tunnels that will try to connect this specific like domain, angrog.i or others. So I guess firewall vendors might be aware of those, or at least you know the security teams, uh, IT teams should be aware of those and start monitoring those services and blocking those IP addresses and domains if someone will try to download and use it. And I, I think the most important is that you know we you know within the security community understand that it's a tunnel, right? And what's the meaning of creating a tunnel directly to your endpoint inside the corporate? And, but I think developers don't understand it. Many, like, you know, like less security aware developers. And um, the problem is that there's no warning on those websites saying, like, oh, that's what could happen to you, right? It's just a webhook testing tool, webhook uh, debugging tool. Or, and also, there could be some solutions. We have some, something we develop internally. We call it WebSocket hook. So, like, you could also expose. Uh, a service, an HTTP application, without really creating a tunnel to your computer, but just you know uh, proxying the data to a specific page, 
uh, we use the WebSocket, that's why we call it. Um, so for the you know, pen testers, it's a nice opportunity, right? Webhooks. So first of all, you could just search for some functionality, webhooks functionality that you have here, there and like use one of the threads there, like SSRF or others to exploit it. Uh, see whether it's like unbound or no uh, blacklisting for local hosts and others. And also reconnaissance for incoming webhooks. And if you see that this application has integrations with third parties, and that's how microservices like all the modern applications work. They combine a combination of different services today. So you could attack this service. For example, just like, I don't know if it's a vulnerability, but you know, on Slack, for example, the channels, if you have the same uh, email address for you know, the same organization, anyone can join this channel. Uh, so if you take over an email, one of the corporate emails, you could use this email to get into all the channels of the company. Uh, so that's something that maybe people don't know when they uh, rely on those services. Uh, enumeration of different domains uh, to find your targets. Um, also services called like request bin and others. So thank you. That was Tomer and myself. Thank you.